Uh, one of my favorite scriptures, pretty consistently, has always been this very mysterious verse that Jesus gives. It's really, really quite short, but it's um, in John 10.10. 10, he says, Jesus says, I came to give you life, come on somebody, and life abundantly. <laughs> life, like here is the creator of the entire world. He comes down in the form of humanity, and one of his primary messages is that he says, I came. One of the reasons, the primary reasons why I came is to give you something that you don't have, which is life. And li it didn't stop there, but he, he says, comma, life abundantly. Like that's life on top of life from the person who created all of it. So for me, whenever I read that, I think there's a, there's a certain level of mystery and curiosity that, that just gives me going in that word to say, what, what is that? Like, what does that life look like? What would it look like right here, right now for me to have abundant life? And then I ask the question, is that abundant life, is it, is it just for after heaven? Uh, is it before heaven? Is it, is it now? Is it in every season of my life? Or is it, um, is it all the above? Is it all the above? It, irregardless if I understand it, I don't know if you're here. Um, I, I don't know maybe the context of it, but when I see that verse that Jesus came to give life and life abundantly, I, I have something inside of me that resoundingly says, yes. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I want it, right? I just, I, I ache and I yearn. I, I want, I feel like I was made for that life, and I, and I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm fully living it right here. But you got to keep reading, because John 10.10 10 is, is encouraging, it's amazing, that he came to give you abundant life. But then there's a, there's a comma. There's another part of that sentence. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says, I came to give you that life, but the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. There's three negative things for the one reiterated positive thing that Jesus gives. And I, I don't know about you, but have you ever found yourself in the middle of that sentence? Like, I, I feel like that's where life is lived, right in the middle of the sentence, right in between that yes, Jesus has given you life. You get glimpses of good things. You get glimpses of life. You get glimpses of things that are breathing life back into you. You, you get rest and you get peace and you, give, you get joy. But then all, all the, at the same time, you have things that are stealing that joy, that are killing the life and just like a, a rug from, out, from underneath you, destroying the very things that bring you that condition. Do, do you ever feel like life is like that? Anybody have a week like that? I mean, I would, if you asked me that question, I'd be raising my hand. Yes, yeah, definitely a week, maybe even the week before and the week before that. And it's been, it's been quite some time where I feel like it's been, we're right in the middle of between, hey, life is amazing, we're enjoying it. But then on the other hand, the moment that I say that, there's a comma, and Satan, I just feel like there's, I don't want to give him more credit than he's due, right? Because we step on him every single time that we walk. But at the same time, he's just annoying. He's like a little dog barking right at your Achilles. You can kick him across the room, which you kind of want to do, but the moment you do, he just comes right back. You're, you come to steal, to kill, and destroy. So then that makes me curious. What does Satan what is the enemy for your life and mine? What does he come to take? What does he come to destroy? Like, what is he after? I, I think Jesus already gives us the answer to that. Life. The enemy comes to steal your life. Not, not the pulse that you have in your physical body, because God actually says later on in the gospel, he goes, don't fear anybody who can take your body. Fear the one who has the power to move your soul in the state of eternal hell or eternal heaven. Fear that person. The ones that can harm your body, don't fear them, because that's just literally fear. So here he is, Jesus saying that I came to give you life, but the enemy also says, just be reminded, someone comes to steal that life, to kill that life, and to destroy that very life that God gives in you. It makes sense why Solomon says in Proverbs 4.23, above all the commandments that I've ever given you, above all the other wisdom, above all the other things I've ever said in 31 chapters of deep Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart. Because from that one place comes the wellspring of life. Life comes from the soul. That's why God wants us to live from the inside out. So now let me just ask you a question. Do you know the attack the enemy has over your life? Do you know where he will come? I mean, when you think about the war that's going on, you know the promise of abundant life, and you know that there is going to be attack. You know that you are in a war. 
You know that there is a battle over the condition of your heart every single day. But do you know how they come in? Paul tells you and me, don't be ignorant about Satan's schemes. Don't be ignorant about the ways that he's going to come and try to steal, kill, and destroy. Because when he does do it, you're going to blame somebody else. You're going you're to think, why is he stealing from me? He doesn't play by the rules. You can't get mad at that. Like He, he just is who he is. But he keeps lying to me. Jesus is like, yes, but that's his common language. I mean, he has no other choice but to lie. He, but he accuses you and thinks that the issue is really with your spouse. It's really with your, your, your kids. It's really with your boss and your employees. and It's your friends. That's where you have the conflict. No, because he's the accusers, come on somebody, of the brothers around you. That's not where your issue is. He is, what he's doing is he's stealing life, the abundant life that Jesus came to give. So I'm just going to reiterate. I don't want you to answer out loud, but do you know the strategy that the enemy has over your life to take what God promised you? And so I, I don't know if you, if you have this answer. There, there might be a couple, but Dallas Willard suggests that this is the answer. I'm going to give it to you in a, in a quote that I, I, Dallas Willard is one of those guys in my life that I, have, I respect uh, immensely. He's been a, a Paul figure in my life and a mentor, and, and uh, he passed away in 2013, but has written countless books and has taught in the side of Christianity and, and made a, a massive um, heritage inside of, of a lot of people. This is what he says around the John 10, the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy the very life that he came. This is what Dallas Willard says, you must ruthlessly eliminate this one thing from your life because it's this one thing that is the great enemy of your spiritual life in our world today. So I want you to take a second, and I don't want you to blurt it out, but I want you to think about what would your answer be? If you're taking notes, go ahead and write it down. Like, what would your answer be? If you put it in there, what must I eliminate from my life? Because this one thing, there's two blanks up there, but it's the same answer. It's one word. This one thing is the great enemy of my life. What's coming to take the life that God promised me? What do you think it would be? And I don't want, you to, I don't want to paint you in the corner, but here's my process. Like, this is what I went through this past week. I looked at this sentence and I said, well, things that are coming up in my mind are things like sin. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that fit? Like that's, a, that's the greatest divide between man and God, right, is sin. That's what, what happened when, when Satan comes. That's what, that's what Jesus came to restore, right, to separate us. So would, would, I'm not trying to paint the picture or trying to get you to answer incorrectly. I really feel like this would fit. This is the process that I went through. I'm like, okay, if I want to put a blank up there, what would I put? I would put sin. So let's just read it. You must ruthlessly eliminate sin from your life because it's sin that is the great enemy of your spiritual life in our world today. I feel like that would fit. Sin, uh, things like greed, make it personal. What would you put? I put like pride, selfishness. Anybody struggle with those? You just feel like, yes, that's what separates me from, that's the, the issue that I have. Just fill in the blank, like just put it in there. And I feel like the, the moment that you think personally what the challenges are for you and you put them in the blank, you start thinking, okay, division, selfishness, sin, pride. Yes, all those fit and they would, they would make sense. But that's not, that's not the answer. And when I, put, when I put those answers in for me, I felt the Holy Spirit say, why would you put things inside of that blank that I have already taken care of? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. That's a good, that's a good revelation because I feel like that's exactly what religion does. I, I, here's what religion says. You, this is, that's the first part of the sentence. Look at it again. You must eliminate sin, pride, selfishness. You name it. You just put it in there. You must eliminate that. But the moment that we think it's your job or my job to eliminate pride, selfishness, division, uh, you, and you name it, is the moment that we say, hey, Jesus, thank you for the life. Thank you for the book. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for dying. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for praying for me as you're on the throne. But no thanks, because I can do this on my own. I need to destroy sin. I need to destroy pride. And that is the very onus of religion. So then the answer is still blank. What's the answer that keeps us, listen to this, 
What's the answer that keeps us from spending time with the God who actually does destroy sin? Come on, somebody. And, and greed and pride and selfishness. What keeps us from spending time with Jesus that actually destroys and makes us a conqueror, that makes us victorious? What is it? Because we can't do it. Dallas Willard says, what is the thing that you and me, we must eliminate? So let me, let me give it to you. He says you must ruth, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Probably not what he thought. You must eliminate hurry from your life because it's hurry that is the great enemy of your spiritual life in the world today. What if I told you that your pace and your schedule and what you jam your days with and what your weeks look like, what if I told you that your very schedule is killing your soul? What if the things that you say yes to are destroying the life that Jesus wants to give you? Would you change anything? Would you shift your schedule? Would you change your liturgy? Would you change your schedule? Would you change what you allowed in your days? Would you shift what is a priority for you? And this is the very essence of and hopefully the tension of our lives. Here I am on the other side of being exhausted and weary and burnt out, where Jesus comes to give life and life abundantly, but I'm on the other side of exhaustion, and I feel like the enemy has stolen from me, killed and destroyed everything that God's trying to breathe back into me so that I can walk through this life victoriously. I don't, I don't feel like I can do that. Well, what do I need to eliminate? I need to eliminate busyness and the capacity for the ease to say yes. Have you, ever, have you ever realized how easy it is to say yes? Like you have a lot of options. And it just, it's a lot easier to say yes than it is no. Have you ever realized that? Like your neighbor comes over, right? Your neighbor comes over, hey, listen, you guys should come over for, um, for a barbecue. We're going to have a barbecue. And you know in the back of your mind, you're leaving literally on a plane for a trip for this weekend. And what comes out of your mouth? Yeah, that sounds great. We'll be there. <laughs> you're like, What's the deal? And then you go back, and you go back to your spouse, and you're like, hey, I just talked to Gary. Um, turns out we're going to be at this barbecue this weekend. And your spouse looks at you like, we're on a plane leaving. We have a trip planned. What do you mean? We can't be the, well, I signed up to bring baked beans. I don't know. I just, I couldn't say no. I just couldn't say no. It's our neighbor. You know, I don't, and the thing that goes on in our mind is I didn't want to disappoint him. Come on, somebody, you with me? I just, I don't know, I just didn't want to, he really wanted us to be there, so I kind of had to be there. So, here's my plan. Um, we're supposed to get up at 5 a.m. To, to get ready and to go catch our flight. I'm going to get up at 4 a.m., go grab some baked beans, drop them off at their house. So like, hey, got baked beans because we signed up for it, but I'm not going to be able to be I'm so sorry. I'm going to put a little sorry note. Thank you for the invitation, and then we'll catch our flight. Sound good? You're like, no, it sounds exhausting. You know what I mean? Come on, anybody with me? I know this baked beans isn't really relevant, but you know, you know the schedule and the condition. That's what happens. Yes is a lot easier than no. And for whatever reason, there's something inside of this that we need to eliminate the busyness and the hurry so that we can obtain the life that Jesus has promised. And now until this point, I haven't actually given you the solution. I've given you the tension. Yes, there's a warfare over your heart. Yes, there's a conflict that some of the steal and kill, destroy. And, and yes, you see the, the nature of your schedule. It's easier to say yes. But now what do you do with it? What's the answer? How can practically you, you actually take the power of what Jesus has given you and walk through it? And here, here's, the, here's how you eliminate this. This is how you destroy the work of Satan. And this is how you obtain the very promise of life and life abundantly. Are you ready? Here it is. Jesus' words in red, Matthew 11. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Here's his answer. Come to me. He didn't say read the Bible. He didn't say go to church. He didn't say add things to your life. He says come to me. He didn't say sign up for a program. He says come to me. Come. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, for I will, somebody read this, for I will give you rest. For I will give you the very thing that your soul longs for, rest, peace, stillness, energy, life, joy, peace, patience, all the fruits of the Spirit come 
when I'm with you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And I, somebody say it, and I will give you rest for your soul. Rest. Doesn't it, isn't it amazing when you just read those words that it does something? Come, come on, read, read this with me. Come to me, all you, you can read, read it out loud, read it with me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that feel better? Your soul just all of a sudden just thinks, your mind starts to just to be still, your, your heart starts to be a little more calm, the weight lifts off, that there is a God who wants you just to be with him. It's amazing that that this, the, the presence of God just comes from the reading of the word and just the invitation. Yes, I want to take you out your word. Yes, I want to rest in you. Yes, I want to live in your presence. Yes, I want to walk this earth right here with this mentality. Sometimes whenever I think about this condition that our world is in and the pace that we, that we tend to keep up, I, I have this, um, this story in this book that continues and... Um, I don't, I, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend the entire book, but, but the moment that I start thinking about our pace and our busyness and slowing down and the invitation to rest in Jesus, I think about this one particular story that this author this brings out. And um, I know it's not a, a, a new thing. The story has been out uh, quite some time. And you might have, might have even heard it. But I want to read to you. Um, it's a fictional story, uh, but I, I believe it has relevance today. The title of this particular paragraph that I want, I want to read to you, the title of the paragraph is this, The Crisis of Busyness and the Need to Belong. <laughs> it's like fitting, right? The crisis that you and I are in of busyness. Crisis of busyness. Let me, let me just read it out. It's, fi- it's fictional, but let me, let me just ask you a question. Do you think that even though this, this might be a made-up story, that it has maybe some sort of relevance? That's my question to you at the end. Satan called a worldwide convention. And in, in Satan's opening address to all the evil angels and the dark forces, he said this, listen, we can't keep the Christians from going to church. We cannot keep them from reading the Bible. We can't keep them from knowing the truth and the word. We can't even keep them from their conservative values and morals. We, ne- we can't even keep them from praying, but we can do something else. We can keep them from forming an intimate, abiding, real, raw relationship with Jesus. Because if they gain the connection with Jesus, our power is broken and we're destroyed. So so here's what we need to do. We need to to have this strategy as we move forward. One of the angels in this convention shouted, how shall we do this? Three words came out of Satan's mouth. Steal their time. I want you to keep them busy with the non-essentials of life. I want you to give them distractions to occupy their mind. I want you to tempt them to spin, 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 borrow, 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 all for the message of more is better. I want you to persuade their wives and their husbands to work long hours and to work maybe six, seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, so they can't even afford the lifestyle that they live. I want you to keep them from spending time with their their marriage and their family and their children so that the very family fragments, breaks apart. Soon their homes will offer no escape to the pressures of life and work. I want you to overstimulate their minds so they can't even hear the still small voice and the whisper of God. I want you to entice them by playing audio clicks and just give them noise everywhere. Radio, iPods, iPhones, movies, email, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, overstimulate them everywhere, TV, PCs, phones, iPads, going constantly throughout their life. And I want you to see every time they come into stores, restaurants, have a non-biblical contradicting message through radio or message, magazines, newspapers, the like, all of them the same, 24 hours a day, invade their driving with billboards, flood their mailboxes with junk mail, sweepstakes, coupons, and catalogs. Even in their recreation and their their vacation, let them be in excess. So that when they return from their recreation and vacation, they will be more exhausted, disquieted, and unprepared for the weeks to come. Don't let them go out to nature and reflect on God's wonders. I want you to send them to amusement parks, sporting events, concerts, movies instead, 
all for the message of entertainment. And when they do gather in groups or in church, make sure that what they talk about is gossip, small talk, criticism, and breaking people down, not building them up. Crowd their lives, because soon they're going to be working in their own strength, sacrificing their own health and their family, all for a good cause. I want you to cause Christians everywhere to get busy and hurry. I'm not sure if that actually happened. But I feel like if you look on the landscape of our life, it kind of holds some truth, don't you think? Are you, are, you, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you exhausted? Can I tell you the irony of this message? I have had the craziest week, and this is the very message that God wanted me to speak on. In fact, most of my week, this week, I had a different message. I was going to go, I was going to go over here, it's gonna, I, and it was going to be good. You guys would have, you guys really, really gotten a lot out of it, but, but midweek, there was this tension inside. I just, I wasn't settled, and, and way late, and I say way late, I, I spent less time, so I feel like this is a confession. Are you good if I confess? I spent less time in, in preparation of this message than I have in any message in a long time. And that's not comfortable for me because I really like to, to let it sit and, and rest in my soul before I give it to you guys. But I just knew that, that God was doing something, mostly in me probably, through the week that I had and also instilling and in hopefully something that has resonated with you. We naturally are inclined to busy and to say yes. And I feel like the pace of Jesus and the pace of the kingdom of God is much slower, and it's deeper, and it's richer than all the other messages of the world. And so here Jesus is in a resounding topic. I know you're inundated. I know you're overwhelmed. I know life is busy, but come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. I want to spend some time with one story. I don't think I told you guys where to go, did I? Usually I, I, tell, you, I tell you where to go. Go to Luke chapter 10. Did I, did I tell you that at the very beginning? By the shuffling of your, your Bibles, probably not. Go to Luke chapter 10. New Testament, first book is going to be Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Hang out in Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is a familiar, maybe familiar story. I feel like inside and outside the church, um, at some point in time, you, you may know of the story of Mary and Martha. This is, this is where we're going. Now, what I, I don't want you to do when it, whenever you go into a particular story, you think, oh, I've read that before. I know where he's going to go. And uh, usually whenever we read Mary and Martha, especially in the context of rest and, and spending time with Jesus, um, we think that the bad person is Martha because she misses it and she gets corrected by Jesus. And, and so then the question usually is, are you Martha? You should feel bad. You should spend more time with Jesus. You should pray more. And all of a sudden the guilt starts coming in. You think, gosh, I'm just a horrible person because I do too much. And I'm not like Mary just sitting at Jesus' feet. I mean, come on. All of us, I think, would agree. If we spent 12 hours a day just sitting at Jesus' feet and reading the Bible and praying, uh, that would be an amazing day, but someone's got to pay the bills, you know what I'm saying? Like, someone has to go to work, someone has to raise these kids, someone has to fix the leaky pipes, and all the other things that go through that are really just your responsibility. So a lot of times what we do is we pick out, yes, I'm Martha, or no, 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 I'm Mary, I just love the Lord, I'm blessed, I, I pray for nine hours a day, and I fast, I, I fast more than I eat, actually, and you know, you, you have those types of people too, you know? I don't know, um, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes we do a, a disservice whenever we look at that, that, that story like that. So here's, what, here's how I want you to look at the story. I want you to look at the, the, the story in a little bit different way as, as we read this. So let, let me read it and kind of talk our way through. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has let me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. Short story, quick story. I feel like there's a lot in this. Here's, here's how I want you to look at this particular story. A, a lot of theologians will talk about the nature of our, of our soul 
and the condition of our heart. And because it's the unseen realm, because we are not super familiar with it, they parallel it to something that we are very familiar with. So a lot of times that whenever they talk about the soul, they'll talk about the soul being like a home or a house. I don't know if you've heard this parallel before, but uh, a lot of times they'll say a house has a lot of layers. It has um, a lot of levels to it. It has basements. It has top floors and stairs to it. So does your soul. It has a lot of layers to it. Uh, they say houses have a lot of rooms and have a lot going on. Some use for storage, some use for occupancy, and some for welcoming guests. Our heart and our soul is the same. Some that we store away in our past that we don't let anybody to. Are there rooms in your house that you don't let anybody in? Come on, it's, it's whenever you clean your room, everything gets stuffed in that room. Anybody have a junk drawer? Like your, your counters get cleaned by opening that one drawer and say, boom, just stuff it. Come on, somebody, you with me? Come on, now do you see the parallel between your soul? Like, your soul, a lot today. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just, I just can't, not today, just can't, I just stuff it away, just deal with it later, suppress it, and hopefully it'll just work itself out. Well, it ten, tends to be when you open that drawer again, a lot of hurt, and a lot of wounds come. You think, I don't, I don't know why I'm so defensive. I don't know why I just yelled at you and, and snapped your head off. You ever, you ever feel like that? Because you just opened up a junk drawer that you haven't given any, anybody access to. That's why there's a, lot of, there's a lot of junk in there, a lot of wounds that you haven't dealt with yet. And so I, that's why a lot of theologians will take the soul, the condition of our heart, and parallel it to a house. And so now I want you to look at this story of Mary and Martha a little bit differently. It's a short story, but I, I feel like it encompasses this particular idea. Your soul is a house in which inside of your soul, you have the tendency for a Martha. You have a tendency to do you have a tendency, a natural inclination to say, if you really love God, you'll do a lot more activities for him. If you really love God, you'd serve and you'd sign up and you'd give and you'd do this and you'd be at the church more. Come on, if, if you really love God, you'd spend a lot of time reading the word. Have you ever thought about those? Has anybody ever told you those? Come on, you with me? Like that's usually the message of religion. If you really love this person, then you would do more. But the only thing that that really brings is condemnation, guilt, and shame. I mean, I know I need to get into the Word. I know I should pray more. I know I should get into the Word. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But all of a sudden, that just weighs on you more and more. It doesn't release anything from you. It doesn't, it doesn't produce life. I mean, I want to I go to church. I want to get into the Word. I want to pray because there's life and there's, there's enjoyment. There's beauty behind it. There's actually delight behind my motives. And, and so then, then we look in this particular story, and I, I want you to just recalibrate it, look at it as a, as a big picture of the house is the picture of your soul. Inside of there, yes, you do have a tendency, a natural inclination for Martha to do, but you also, maybe deep down inside, suppressed maybe a little bit, you have the desire, the hope, the longing just to be with Jesus. I would love this. I would love just to sit at his feet. Anybody? I would love just to listen to him. I would love to spend hours. I just don't have hours. I would love to open up the word. I just, I just don't have time. I would love to pray for an extended amount of time. I would love to have a day of solitude, like maybe once a year. I just don't have the time. Come on, somebody, you with me? Why? Because I'm too busy. I'm too busy. And so here, I just want to pick out a couple observations from the conversation that happens between Mary and Martha and Jesus Oh, one last thing. Inside, inside of this, uh, the picture of our soul, inside the picture of the house that this story finds, you have a, a, a picture of, of Martha, tendency for Martha and a desire for Mary. But who's also inside of your soul? Jesus. And he wants to clean everything up. He wants to order things. He wants to correct you. He wants to speak to you. Come on, you with me? This is, this is a story of the condition of our soul. So verse 40 says, Martha was distracted. These are, these are the words from Jesus. Martha was distracted by much serving. But I, I don't get it because doesn't Jesus say, I came not for you to serve me, but I came to, come on somebody, serve? I came that you don't, you don't serve me. I came to give you an example to serve. So why is it that he says, Martha, you're distracted with much serving when he says that's one of the reasons why he came? And, and I just want to suggest that it's, an, it's a thing of priorities and it's a thing of order. When you get the order of how and why you serve out of mix, you're going to become exhausted. So the moment 
that you do serving, that you give, that you, that you add to your to-do list, that you, that you feel obligated to do all these things for Jesus and, and a whole lot of other people just because of obligation and guilt and shame, you're doing it not out of rest, not out of contentment, not out of joy, not out of delight, but out of religion. Because you feel like the more that you'll do, hopefully the more God will be approved by you. And that, ne- that message has is, is never come up in the Gospels. So the, the more tendency to do, Jesus says, all I want you to do is rest in what I've already done. And the more you rest, you want to know what happens? The more you rest, the more you listen, the more you spend time, the more your heart will have a tendency and a bent to serve other people, to love other people. That's where serving is supposed to come from, a healthy condition of our heart, a heart filled up with rest, filled up with stillness. Now, let me, let me show you the other thing that happens. Martha, uh, and you guys probably don't struggle with this, but I'll just read it for the other, like your friends who struggle with this. Martha says that she goes, she goes on and say, um, Lord, do you not care? <laughs> Have you ever started your prayers off like that? Lord, I guess you just don't care about me. You, you care about my neighbor, my friend, my coworker, and even my spouse, my children. I can name everything that you care, but you, apparently you don't care about me because you don't answer my prayers. You're not speaking to my word. I go to church. I do all these things, but you haven't really, come on somebody, anybody? Anybody with me? She goes on. You, you don't care about me that my sister has left me to serve alone. Isolation. That's, that's a good tendency. Do you feel isolated? Do you feel like you're in this alone? Do you feel like nobody else understands you? Then, then you, have, you have a need to find rest in Jesus. Rest. Just be with him. Just hang out with him. Spend some moments with him. Just listen. That's what, that's what Mary's doing. She's listening. You want to know how to enter into rest? Listen. Pay attention. Listen to what God's saying. Listen to the word. Listen to the, 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 the still, small whisper, the thoughts that are the natures of God. So, so then Martha goes on, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever tried to give direction to somebody else through prayer? Come on, you holy people. Like, <clears throat> I'm having some issues at work with my spouse and my children. Lord, I pray that you would convict them. You know, just, <laughs> just straighten them out. Hey, man, what's up? How you doing? Man? I, was, I was just praying for you. I was just praying for you. You're thinking, man, that's, and the other person's like, man, I really appreciate that. And you're like, not if you knew what I was praying. You know? <laughs> so, so here's another tendency. Here's another tendency. If you find yourself criticizing other people and comparing yourself to other people, you need to rest. D- does anybody? Do you, do you compare? You don't, you, don't, you don't compare. You don't compare your life to anybody else's and be like, wow, I wish I was. Do you, do you ever have the sentence come out of your mouth? It's going to be better when we get to this season. Hey, just wait, because it won't always be like this. Do you you compare yourself on Instagram and Facebook, and and you're like, oh, man, must be nice. I'm not even going to heart it, because I'm, you know, I'm I'm not going to comment, because I'm um, I'm a little bit bitter. You just kind of scroll past the friends who are on vacation. Come on, anybody? Are you, do you compare your life? And then, and then do you, do you take it a step further and start to criticize do you start breaking people down in your mind, and then all of a sudden in your mind it comes out as your thoughts? You start, you start saying things that are just breaking people down? You, you have a need to rest in the presence of God, to get with them, to listen. Because when you, when you sit in his love, when you're still and you just posture your soul underneath the care of Jesus, you allow the Holy Spirit just to start filling you up. You come out of that place and you start, and you, and you know when it happens because then you have, you have the tendency to, to see the best in people. It's called honoring. You, you pull out encouragement. You tell other people how great they are and what you see in them. And you honestly, genuinely, you want to serve. You want to serve them. And you, and you ask questions, like, how can I help? What can I do? How, how can I be of service? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I help? And you do it out of not an exhausted and obligated heart, out of a joyful heart. You look at your spouse. I want to be, be here for you. You look at your kids. Hey, what do my kids need? You have the, the intuition and the insight because you've, you've sat in the love of God and you genuinely look at them and you can love on them and serve. 
The picture here gives us an invitation consistently. When we move into the Martha, hey, we need to do, we need to do more, 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 busy, hurry, hurry, hurry. We have a tendency to just say, hey, you know what, I need to, I need to rest. I need to rest in God's peace. I need to be right where he is and just say yes to him in Jesus' name.